Well, nobody could ever accuse us of being professional. Thanks, Tom. No. <laughs> <laughs> Big, we, we always got to do this. Dumb <laughs> animal. Usually it's you. Yeah, well, I, I had all my shit right. Everything was on. Everything worked. You definitely did. Today. <sighs> Everything all my worked. open. And I blew it. Mm-hmm. All right. Mm-hmm. Power and speed. We're back again. Nine, Thomas, nine, read off our information, Thomas. Mm-hmm. Sorry. Sorry. I don't mean to step on you. Yeah, Go ahead. Read it off. 908-751-0211. And you know what to do. What, what should they do, Ted? Like us on Facebook. That's right. <laughs> and more, and also, um, awesome. yes, put something on iTunes if you're an Apple user. Yep. Um, you know, a review, a like, you know, Facebook, whatever. Hatred. Yeah. Well, yeah. Put leave hatred. I don't care. Doesn't matter to me. I mean, a review is a review. Ben that, on guy, that guy's here. Crunch is here. Made it on time. I'm here. I, I thought I was. Uh, I know. Almost a half an hour early. I know. And there's probably going to be some people that are going to be a little screwed up on this. And and actually, I probably got to take a look at it real quick. Uh, the way I posted the link on Facebook, it appeared that what we were really saying is that, you know, Howard from Redline Performance would be on at 7.15, and I was really trying to say 7.15 start time. So, you know, just a, a typical case of your brain going faster than yeah. your fingers. <laughs> like like ours usually do. Yeah. So I'll we'll get that all ironed out later. It'll be fine. But he's going to call in at what, 7.15? Yeah. All right, yep. good. Yep. And what did you do this weekend, Thomas? You had an eventful weekend. Yeah, I was in, I was in California. Mm. Um, big, I went to big dogs. <laughs> everybody is looking at me like they want me to say it. I went to Subi Fest. <laughs> Can you explain for the listeners what Subi Fest? Is? Yeah, because that could be misinterpreted. Yeah, I know. Uh, it is a really big Subaru event um, put on put on by a group out in Cali, and um, it's really good. And you know, because we are so big in Subaru, uh, and it's such a good commodity for us, uh, we feel compelled to go out there and uh, you know put up a display and show our wares. Man. And it is a huge show, right? Huge. And Subaru does particularly well, really for well. you as a product, line. really well, really well. And just to give you an idea, the show is in the infield at Fontana Speedway where they have a NASCAR race. Okay. It's not, wow. some, it's not some little, you know, dive event. There was an NMCA race going on adjacent to it at the drag strip, and we were in the infield of the, of the big track, two-mile track. Okay. So it's pretty cool. And I know that while you are out there, you made contact with a, a particularly good Subaru guy who's going to come on. Yes. Oh, well, I didn't make contact oh, yeah, with you know him. him. He was out there with me. Um, you worked out the details. Yeah, yeah. We, uh. We displayed next to each other. He's one of my customers, and he's a really good um, Subaru enthusiast and Subaru engine builder. They build cars. They build engines, and he's also a manufacturer. He's got a lot of CNC equipment, and he makes a lot of uh, Subaru-specific parts. Yeah, he so said the guy does, like, closed-deck blocks. And- yeah, 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 yeah. High-end stuff. Yeah. Pretty cool stuff. It'll be good stuff for us to talk to to kind of break into the, uh, you know, the import side. And, you know, I make fun of the Subarus, and it's just – Everybody's got their own taste. You do? Yeah, yeah a little bit. <laughs> you do? A yeah. little, little bit. Here and there. I, I didn't know you that. You can't really say most of the things he says to me about him. <laughs> yeah, no, I can't. I can't. But that's, you have to do that. You yes. know, like he's the guy that you'd pull up next to him and you'd like, you just have to laugh at him. But you, his, you would. his Subaru actually looked good though. It does. It does. Yeah. So, yeah, I was there and, uh, you know, I, I don't know if we talked about this, but um, the guys from Dubai that we went out to see and, and. We'll talk about this later on with Howard because Howard uh, met these guys when we were out there. Um, they met me in California, and we went to the Sand Sports Show. Now you're kind of into this stuff, the side by side deal, right? You have that razor. That you, oh yeah, that you like jump over your house with and shit. Yep. So I was never aware that that stuff was so big. You know, I think we're going to this little, you know, mom and pop show. Right. It was enormous. Are you talking about like the four wheelers and banshees? Yeah, and all yeah, that kind banshees, four wheelers, side by sides, four seaters. They go up to, uh, you know, they build buggies for out in the desert with, um, you know, thousand, twelve hundred horsepower LS ones and sequential transes. There was one out there that that there was a quarter of a million dollar price tag on for a, 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 a dune buggy. Wow! And it didn't have air conditioning. <laughs> Crazy. Wow. Two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Quarter million dollars. Yeah, that's what two fifty. It yeah, is. I that's was, like I was doing them. I was doing running. running the I was running the numbers. <laughs> Sorry, Alan. Um, <laughs> it <laughs> car guy stuff. I mean, I'm just keeping the seat warm for him. <laughs> you know. Oh boy. Yeah, I, I got to tell you, the side by side market is. Uh, I Brian bought a Razor when they first came out a Polaris RZR 800 S. 
that's a thing. You went for a ride, Mana Crunch, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You tried to jump the the hill. We didn't try. We. I'm saying you yeah. you could have went higher, but I, you know I was over here yeah, screaming like a B I T C. Me but, too. Uh, but know. that <laughs> when like Brian, he got a bug up his ass. He's like, I gotta buy one of these things. Yeah. And he's looking at like you know the what are they the John Deere things and everything. I said, Oh well, yeah, yeah, yeah. I said yeah. that's if you're a farmer. I said you want to fuck around. So you know he bought the pliers, which was the one to get at the time. Yep. And it was amazing. I mean, it jumps, it lands. It's you know, it's what Tad and I explored the the gas pipeline yeah, the pipe on. Line, right? Yep. Did well, then throw me in with that. Yep. Two, maybe three years later, might have been one more year. I, I don't remember how the timeline went, but they came up with an RZR nine hundred. And the one thing that's wrong with Brian's is it has like control arm suspension all the way around, right. like regular A arm. Yep. And listen, I'm not hating on Polaris, but it's stupid. The way they have the arms lined up, that you know, you can't do alignments on them. Like everything is kind of fixed. Yeah. I mean, you can do toe, but that's about it. Like your camber's off, you know, you're kind of screwed. That's yep. why they, you know, the aftermarket jumped on that, all kinds of components. The new ones, like massive travel, trailing link suspensions. I mean, they're they're really nuts. And now yeah, the, the, the Yamaha. Yeah. The horsepower wars are on. Right. Polaris released a thousand CC one that made like a hundred and ten horsepower. Then I guess it was Can Am released one with a yep. Rotax motor that yep. made like 115. Yep. Yamaha got on into this and said, okay, well, we're not going to use the snowmobile clutch, like meaning that there's no trans. It just, it's a variable pulley change. Right. You know, on drive and driven. Um, they went to, Yamaha went to a five speed sequential. Wow. Which what, is insane. Wet clutch. I mean, it, it's like Formula One stuff. Yeah. That, that to me is, this is like the two stroke com- conversation. That's what makes it fun. Yeah, right, right. exactly. The Polaris is off-putting because I'm not a snowmobile guy. Never liked them. Don't like the cold. Don't <laughs> want to screw around in the snow. Right. But when you get on the throttle, they're like, Ree! and they just go up to an RPM until the clutch catches up, and then the thing goes faster and the RPM comes up. It's goofy. Yeah. Right, right. It's like driving around in high gear with a real loose converter. Gotcha. It's just, I don't like it. And funny thing is, funny you're mentioning that because the the, the Dubai guys said the same thing. You know, obviously they want to go fast. Obviously they want to have fun, but they they were telling me that the sound of the deal makes a difference because we were talking about the buggies and why they put V8s in them. You know, you can make so much power with a V6 and smaller, lighter, shorter. Yeah. He's like, yeah, but they don't sound like that. Yeah. And it's true. I mean, you know, when car people, car people want some kind of cool sound. Right. They just do. Brian's Polaris was a two cylinder. I believe and I'm talking out of my ass here because I don't know about the 1000 CC one that was made like last year or the year before. Right. Um, I believe that was a twin cylinder also, but really revised. Like Brian's is old school, like almost tractor motor, like what Polaris has always I'm pretty sure it was too, because the guys made a point of saying that the Yamaha is a three cylinder and it didn't appear to me like anything else else, anything else was. Okay. Well, the new Polaris that they just released to compete against the Can-Am Turbo is a Polaris turbo that I believe makes 144 horsepower. So these things are getting pretty serious. Now, yeah. the new Polaris is a three-cylinder, um, completely redesigned motor again, and, you know, looks pretty serious. But I got to tell you, that Yamaha one, even though it's down in power, it has the gear multiplication factor, right, right. which we talked about right. last it, week. It makes with, you feel you have more control. Exactly. You talked about it with Tommy Martino, that if you can get a little more gear. Now, I don't know what the max RPM of one versus the other is because that gives you multiplication. And I mean, yep, yep. but for my money, no, not only that, speaking of money, the Polaris, um, I was just about to ask you, give me some prices on these things. 25 starting. Yeah. Yeah. That's as in thousand. thousand. Right. For the buggy. Well, it's yeah, a, it's, a, it's, it's a, a side by side. It's right. a side by side. Right. But it's, 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 it's wide open. So it's a buggy style. Yeah. yeah it's yeah, like yeah. the thing yeah. you were in. Right. Right. Yeah. 25 but, grand. Yeah. I mean, that's a, that's a, what, a, a Chevy shit box, like a regular. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you could buy a pretty nice Colorado for 25. Yeah. I mean, you're getting a toy to drive around like a jerk off for, <laughs> for right, 25. Right. Um, pretty fast though. But now the Yamaha and, and I had just, it's so funny that Tom brought all this up because I was just going through this, looking at all this stuff the other day. Cause I, I'd like to get a good one, like the right good one. But I think that this whole conversation made it pretty clear that the good ones aren't done yet. Like there's going to be the next leap, the next leap, the next right, leap. Right. Yeah, but that's like computers. You can wait forever. Right. I know, so but here's my question in. to you, Mike. Will you buy one at $30,000 for a nice fast one? Maybe. 
just to ride around here on the compound? Maybe. Wow. Maybe. <laughs> I mean, look, we can we can go in the way back and clear a track out and then see if we can end up in the woods. I mean, you know, we we could and and, you, and we could end up in the woods. And so. what what'll happen is I'll buy one. Brian will buy another good one, and then it's going to be a mess. Then it's going to be then you'll be aftermarket. racing each other. Oh yeah, aftermarket yeah. parts, and you know, <laughs> all, all you know, sneaking around, ordering stuff, having it delivered someplace else so yeah. you don't see it. Nitrous. Yeah, we'll then get the Tad, we'll get the razor. Tad will have to buy one, and then Crunch no, will have no, no, to no. come in with one, and mine will have chrome rims on it. <laughs> <laughs> we know where this is going. So yeah, they're um, you know 144 horsepower, and on one and a and a normally aspirated. You know, the, the sequential gearbox, yep. this is getting serious in a hurry. Well, let me but, ask you this. Yeah. How much horsepower does like a 750 or 1,000 GSX-R, how, how much do they make? I'm not good at that. Tad probably knows. What does an R1 make? I've been out of that so But they're long. not over 200. No. No, no. no. Oh, 50? So, so these, oh, wow. Buck 45, buck 50? Power. No, they got to have more than that, dude, because my Buck's CBR 1000 years ago made 148. Hmm. So it's, it's, I'm sure they got to be like probably in the 180 area. Probably. Well, then that's a lot of power for a side by side. Pro, well, st- pro stock bikes are around three twenty five, I think. Not different. Gracious. Well, here's what I don't understand. A lot. What what is Yamaha waiting for? Don't you have a whole stack of R one motors over there? I know. With a gearbox already in them. <laughs> we were talking um, about that before. Yeah. You know, come on. <laughs> Throw it in. Bolt it in. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. I know. Okay. Now, what's what's that uh, machine that looks like a car and you can register it and drive it around? That looks like a three wheel motorcycle. Oh, those, yeah, there's oh, one those. with a wheel on the back. Yeah, there's they, a they KTM really with the oblong and crazy. Yeah. Not my cup of tea. Yeah, I don't know yeah, why. I don't like that. I would never know what the name of that is. I don't know. There's a Polaris one. There's a KTM one. There's, and there is something called a, what is it? An Expo that's a KTM. The, that's actually four wheels. Is it? Yeah. The Expo. Cause they race them like inside. I saw them on top gear and yeah, stuff. That, that thing, the KTM one's got an Audi engine in it. It's kind of defeats the purpose yeah i mean all, all that stuff that's all goofy shit i want to go out and tear dirt up and rip <laughs> yeah. up my neighbor's lawn and just yeah. you know just be a general teenager again jump over your own house <laughs> you know i know that Redline's going to be calling it a little bit um you think he has any information about the the new zr1 corvette because that might be what i was waiting for um i don't know you know it's possible he he does know people at gm he kind of always seems to be uh you know on the cutting edge of information I, I personally, you know, Lord knows that my Corvette frustrates the shit out of me. (laughs) I mean that. I don't know if he's gonna be able to help you with that. No, unless unless um, he has a can of gas. (laughs) He might. Yeah. He might. Um, he might know about it. He, and he might not. He's more, obviously his expertise is, uh, well, it's in all of it, but really what he does in his company is the calibration. Yeah. And he builds engines too, but he has, you know, he has a group that. They all do certain things. He'll explain what yeah. they do. No, I mean, pretty comprehensive looking at his stuff. But, yeah, like, I know. I you know, know. I, I was all for it. Tad knows it. We've talked about it. I couldn't wait for the Z06. I was waiting for specs. I was hoping they were going to up the power level in comparison. Like the Hellcat, you know, was being touted as 700. I'm like, come on, GM, a little smaller pulley, you can do this. Yep. You know, I was I was all in ready. And then I saw how heavy the thing was that I saw all this stuff about. I'm like, oh, what the fuck? Yeah. You know, the, the car just got like another, I think it was like 200 pounds heavier. You know, Howard might be able to correct that too, if I'm wrong about it. But a lot of things were kind of disappointing in that one. Yep. But a lot of people gave it decent reviews. So I, I don't know. But I mean, a mid-engine one, like stepping into. I the, know. I know. We were talking about, you know, will it be all-wheel drive? Yeah. Could, could it be all-wheel drive? Well, or don't forget. That? Yeah. Oh, no. Don't yeah. tell me. Yeah, mid-engine. Yeah, that's that's the new oh, that's one. The one. Yeah, we we saw that. You sent me the link. Yep. I mean, look, I was looking at a McLaren. That's a rear-wheel drive. Yep. But it's kind of a McLaren. Well, now the new Ford GT is a rear-wheel drive, but it's a V6. So the, at least the GM's going to be a V8. Yeah, I, w- I was happy to see that that they didn't you know abandon the uh, the V8. Well, side. they don't have an EcoBoost device. No, so. and they they also yeah. didn't abandon or later. They didn't abandon the you know in cam. Uh, in block cam no and, and that's that's they're, nice to say yeah they're hanging on yeah i i think uh, I'm, i've got high hopes for it i really do and that that's they're gonna i guess they're gonna make that platform i don't know if that's c seven and a half or c eight but it would be really strange that they release the zr1 and then adopt the platform like release right the big dog ahead and then release the little car you yeah. know the, the consumer car next production year or who yeah. knows or it could be, you know, a completely specialized section of Corvette. Do they afford that? Who knows? 
He's sending me, you know, we're going to have fun in a couple minutes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No doubt. Well, as a matter of fact, it's not a couple of minutes. He's on here. Hang on. Let me, let me pull him in. See if everything works. Howard, you there, buddy? Yes, sir. Nice to talk to you, man. Thanks for calling in. You too. Appreciate it. I'm just listening to some of the uh, shenanigans already. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The, uh, nice picture, man. All powered. You like that? <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's what I do on my free time. I know. We've right. actually been better behaved. We, we've we toned it down a little bit because you could imagine it with, uh, you know Tom pretty well. Um, yeah. Th- this could yeah. go off the rails badly. Ha- it has gone <laughs> off the rails badly. But, uh, well, you know, let's introduce him. This is Howard from Redline Motorsports. And uh, he's um, not only a customer of mine, but he's a friend. And uh, he's a, a very accomplished uh engine builder tuner he uh, he guitar player he does a lot of things and um you know it's kind of came up um i was i was i was breezing through the magazine rack at the airport you know looking through cosmopolitan and you know stuff that tad reads <laughs> and i saw yeah. uh this is a while ago uh well not too long ago i saw his uh, corvette on the cover of um vet magazine i'm like you know we gotta get a hold of this cat and see what he's up to because he's always up to Something crazy. So here he is. And this here was the seven second Corvette. Yeah. Oh. Yep. I got to tell you, it was funny because Tad, who's, who's also here, I'm, I'm hopefully I, he'll talk at some I brought point. that up that I brought that up a while ago. And that's when Tom said, I know that guy. I give him parts. I was yeah. Like, okay. That, that got, that got posted on the Facebook page and I watched that. And I think my comment was that was a beautiful pass or a perfect pass or whatever. It looked so nice. Yep. I mean, for, for a regular so we'll call it a regular suspension Corvette. How long was that in the makings to, to get there? Well, interestingly enough, the, the article that Tom's talking about, we, we do a lot of technical stuff with the magazines, and, and uh, Scott Parker, who's the editor of Vet Magazine, I've known for a lot of years, um, grabbed me and said, hey, we, we want to do something on that car. And the article was really, I guess, more of a write-up about my career and how I got where I am, but also how the car got dragged from being purchased brand new to where it is. And, you know, I bought that car brand new in in early 2006 and I told all my friends, I'm not modifying it. I already had a bunch of other modified cars. So that's, (laughs) that already tells you where, how things end up in my, uh, my world. Can't leave anything alone, much like I'm sure a lot of the people that listen. And, uh, you know, the car started out like any other project, you know, a few bolt-ons and you're driving it and you're street racing it. And then, we ended up putting a couple uh, turbochargers on it when it was still a stick car when I was up in New York, and it just started turning into a psycho machine. And um, I don't know if Tom's told you, but we when we relocated from New York to South Florida, the car was just sitting in the corner there, and I'm like, we got to do something fun with this thing. And uh, let into an automatic, and then let into another motor and bigger turbos, and next you know you're gunning for a number. And uh, I guess it's that's the normal path of any addiction uh, typically in this type of motorsport. So, you know, the cars, the car kind of gives me a, a taste of adrenaline, which I definitely need to have quite often. And, um, also, you know, for the business, it shows people that we have the, the brains, the power and the capacity to build missiles. Well, it was kind of funny because when, when I saw that, and when I started talking to Tom about, uh, I have two of them, I have a 2001 C5 and a 2013 427. And, the, the, the 427 one has been a basket case. It's just the motor went bad in 1800 miles, hit a deer at 3,200, uh, clutch went bad at, I don't know, 9,000. A couple weeks ago. Yeah. I mean, I've just, and yeah, I'm hard on equipment, no yep. doubt about it. But the one thing that I know from my 2001 is I, I have friends like a friend of mine worked at East coast supercharger, John Romano, yep. Tom knows him, yep. passed away, yep. um, told me all the things that are going to break in the C5, like in the rear and the trans and what they're doing, like, you know, supports and everything. So I was really interested. I even mentioned at the time, I said, yeah, but these platforms are a mess, dude. There's nothing stays together in the back of them. And then I saw what went in the back of that car. That was pretty impressive. Well, you know, it's, it's a, it's a, we get this question a lot as a shop, you know, guys are like, Oh, do I need to put a rear in the car? Do I need to put axles in it? And it really comes down to like, what are you doing with the car? I mean, obviously for the exhibition running that we do with that car and the power level that it makes and how hard we have to hit that car out of the hole to get it to run a number. I mean, we're putting some serious load on that car. Um, but interestingly enough, up until last year, um, we were still running a stock, the original stock diff in the car and going eight fifties at 170 with the car. 
Wow. wow. Stock diff. That's pretty good. Now, you know that the diffs are always breaking. Guys are blasting them out, but... You know, we, we converted the car to an automatic, and just the way we got the suspension working, the way the tire was working, you know, any car that leaves good doesn't, we say it leaves hard, but really it's leaving very linear. And it's the cars that leave explosively hard are the ones that usually tend to break more stuff. So, you know, it's, it's kind of like a goes against the grain of what normally breaks, because I say, we, you know, we drove that car to many mid-eight second passes with a stock diff in it, you know? So... But, you know, when you get to the level we're at, it not only becomes something that you want to improve on to longevity, but it comes a life safety issue, too, when you're blasting down the track. You know, you don't, yeah. you don't want to be thinking about what's going to fall out the back of the car when you're not down to the end yet, you know? Yeah, an independent failure can be bad. Yeah. can be very bad. Yeah. Ugly. Yeah. Hey, how's the, uh, how's the, sorry. What's that? No, say, how's the move from Florida, from New York to Florida been? Um, It's been... It was a good move. I mean, obviously, to expand the business, which is what I wanted to do, uh, you know, upstate New York where I was, just, just with the weather season pattern alone makes it difficult to keep yourself busy. <laughs> you go four months up in New York where, you know, it's it's very limited season, and, and the level I want to go to it wasn't going to work. But Florida, at least with the weather, a um, lot more crazies down here for sure. We've got racetracks all the way around us. Um, it's been awesome. I mean, adapting to the the culture down here, eh, it's been different. You know, forty two plus years living in uh, upstate New York, it's uh, growing up in the city. You kind of it's different. Yeah, but um, get used to it. <laughs> you're you're getting them used to you. Yeah, they're dealing. You know, it's funny you say that because <laughs> you know, and, and not to differentiate New Yorkers from anybody else, but I guess I have to because it's. You know, I realize more now than ever that there's an attitude that you're bred into from that genre of the country, New Jersey, wherever it may be. Mm. And when you come down here, um, there's a lot of New Yorkers, and, and they really appreci- appreciate the uh, in-your-face, tell-like-it-is attitude. Sure they do. Um, which is how we operate, and I think it's been, as much as it's rubbed some people, which I'm aware of, it's going to happen, we've gotten more good out of it than bad. I believe that. Because you know, we tell people we're not here to be your friend, and we'd like to be your friend, but we're here to to do a good job, meet the goals that you're looking for, use the right parts, and get it done. And then we'll be friends afterwards for sure. So we're not going to sugarcoat it going into it. It is what it is. Yep. You know, yep. and that's a tough business because the Corvette guys they are a picky, strange bunch. You know, not 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 saying it badly, but I mean, we made reference like the guy will come in with Corvette socks and shoelaces, shoelaces and that, I mean, <laughs> yeah. Those are those guys. There's no doubt about it. We throw those guys right out of here. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we had to pick a guy, you know, Hank Manley's got his ZR1. Yeah. <clears throat> and he wanted some power and we had to pick a guy and, uh, Howard was my choice, obviously. And, uh, I got to, that was the first time I got to see him actually work through a project mm-hmm. and, uh, it was pretty impressive. The whole deal. It's impressive. Uh, it's also cool to watch a guy, you know, watch a, a guy and his crew work on a car. Uh, to the level that they have the experience to know, you know, what the other guy's doing and, you know, lifting the car off the frame. And ju- it just, re- it was cool. It was really cool. Hmm. And obviously the result we got um, was pretty damn good. Yeah. You've talked about his ZR1 a couple times, at, yeah. at least to me. I don't know if we mentioned on the show, but it's. Uh, I don't remember, but it made nearly 800. We call it 800. Um, but it, 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 Hank just, every time I talk to him, he, he just. You know, it's like a big toy for him, and he loves driving it every day. That's what most of these things end up being. Like like what Howard's got there it was a toy, and it just progresses and gets worse and yep. worse and worse. That's, that's the path. Toy. Yeah. That's toy. <laughs> yeah, that's the path that all this stuff inevitably takes. Um, yeah. you know, I, I got a question that, you know, maybe some of the listeners would want to know about, but for me, it's particular interest. Um, I did read the read your thing about how you got into the tuning and the fuel injection and everything else, and I kind of started the same way but because of what i was doing engine wise it didn't intersect like yours did so i i left it like i had never really done any stock programming but the direct injection thing that's particularly interesting to me has that opened up any new doors for what can be done yeah i mean it, it's it's opened up doors uh for shops like us and a few others there's obviously other shops in the country that are you know starting to get a grasp around it but there's a lot that don't have a grasp around it so i guess that might be considered a door at the same time it's closed a bunch of doors because 
uh, some of the functionality of the system has made it very hard to, you know, make big numbers like we were accustomed to with a port fuel motor. Um, you know, back uh, 2013 and 12, if I wanted to make 1,200 horsepower, I just bought a, an injector that did the job. I put a fuel system in that got the job, and I made enough fuel mass to make the power. With direct injection, we don't have the offerings of injectors and pumps, so we're hitting walls, and uh, we're finding alternate ways to get the job done. And it's kind of, I don't know if you guys remember, like, Carol Supercharger back in, like, the late 80s. Mm-hmm. I think they were up in Jersey somewhere. And I, I always remember how they had this ninth fuel injector that just shot random fuel into the intake uh, to support the additional power because nobody could program the car. Yep. And we're a little bit back to that again. It's just funny how it's like bell bottoms that, you know, it comes full circle. Um, <laughs> well, whatever you do, don't bring the bell bottoms back. <laughs> well, I'm just, wait, I didn't bring them back. It just, they came back, but you know, <laughs> he just wears them. He's like a boomerang, <laughs> right? you know? So, so, you know, we find ourselves with these very sophisticated high tech, you know, cars, the C sevens and stuff like that. And then we find ourselves having to go back to our roots, um, because we're not going to sit around and wait for the industry. We're going to make the industry, you know? So, um, that's been, a. Uh, I've got a pretty cool car in the shop right now. It's a 2015 automatic Z06 customer mine up in uh, South Carolina. And uh, this guy is just, he just wants to go as fast as the thing can go. And we built a whole custom supercharger system and our own fuel system. And it's it's a little bit uncharted land right now, you know. I mean, the calibrating is very difficult because um, we don't have all the tools we need. But we said the same thing in uh, in '97 when the LS1 came out. We did the same thing in 2005 when they changed the C6, and you know, we'll figure it out. We'll get around it. You know, have the tuning software companies like made an active effort to to get more unlocked, so to speak, to be able to do this? Like- yeah, I mean the, the the problem with the aftermarket um, guys that are out there, HP tuners, EFI Live, two phenomenal companies is that they're really not calibrators. They're software guys. So, you know, they go mucking through a calibration and they start digging out all kinds of stuff. And we sit there and we're like, well, I don't know if the screwdriver is going to fit the screw or not, but you gave it to me. Let me see what works. You know, so it's a very interesting game between what they pull out of a calibration and what we are able to use and know what it does. There well, is no book on this stuff. Well, don't they primarily learn how to, to kind of get in the back door and figure out what, what maps are what? Hope, hopefully being right most of the time, and, and then the calibration is really more on you. Oh, well, it's all on you, right? It, it, it is, but take, for example, the new C7 stuff. You know, the new the computer's the E92. You know, it's a, it's a torque-based control system, and everything is about torque, what you make, how you make it, and where it all goes. And, you know, today when you hit the throttle pedal, even though you're, we, we've never really been attached to the throttle like a carburetor, now you hit that pedal, and it's 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 got a torque request table. and says, hey, I, I, I want to make, you know, 300, you know, foot pounds of torque. It says, all right, well, is this in check? Is this in check? Is everybody good? Can we do this? And all this integration is going at one time. And then here we go. We, we move another 40 pounds a minute of air through the motor. It ain't happy. Cause it's like, whoa, who invited this thing to the party? So it's a, it's a struggle sometimes getting all these things to um, accept the change. Um, there's a lot of what's called closed loop function that, you know, if you get outside of a range, it tries to pull you back in the range. Well, I don't want to be in that range. I want to be over there. I want to be where the power is. So, you know, we, we have tables, we have a lot to work with. Some of it you look at and nobody wants to go near it. And, uh, and believe me, nobody in the outside world, uh, you know, outside of GM really has a total control grip on it. Like the OEM does. I mean, talking millions of dollars of, uh, engineering and a staff of guy only knows how many people believe me we're not going to untangle it that fast but you know we, we figure it out you would think that gm with and and you know i mean look especially with what's going on now you know you've got chrysler um pushing a, a, a horsepower challenge you know i mean it's and we always talked about this the technology is available for a streetcar to roll out of the factory it astronomical levels it really is i mean they have fantastic budgets they i mean the hellcat to run out at 700 and you know the z06 at 650 i mean that was unheard of years ago so yeah. the electronics have, have made a lot possible but i i can't believe that gm is not i want to say more helpful yeah, <laughs> to the aftermarket yeah. division you know it's f- funny well, i i just sorry uh, i just read where Ford is actually <clears throat> enticing people to get involved in, in the EcoBoost tuning. 
I mean, mm-hmm. they're they're actually going to open their stuff up more to the tuner world. I just read it yesterday. Really? Yep. So, I mean, Chevy and Ford, I mean, Chevy and uh, Chrysler should take a cue from that. Yeah, you buy a car because you're an enthusiast. Right. You, you, that and, and you probably, chances are pretty good, you want to mess with it. You, you want to start well, screwing around. Why do you think Chrysler sales have not been as good as you think they would be from, from the, those performance cars? Is because Chrysler has made it very difficult yep. to obtain calibration, support, and control. That's why that market is, is as weak as it is. I mean, granted, it may not be as prevalent as the uh, GM and the Ford side. That's always been a you know a pony war rivalry from the beginning. But a lot of guys would not buy a Challenger because the 2012 you couldn't get in and do anything, and they're like, I'm not buying it. I want to put a supercharger on my car. So you know, there stuff seems to leak out. But you have to realize, guys, that you know that the, there's a government. <laughs> Which is another. We'll save that for another nine-hour conversation. <laughs> it's constantly sticking their fingers up the ass of the fun factor, you know, and and it limits this stuff. And you know, I, I have a lot of friends of mine that work at GM. I understand what goes on. I have a lot of respect for what they have to deal with. Their, their rules are different than us, you know. Yeah. I mean? And and we all walk a fine line with it. I mean, you know, the world's falling apart and going crazy, and guys just want to drive their cars and have fun. It calms us down. Yeah, know? yeah. It keeps yeah. keeps a lot of violence. <laughs> Yeah. at bay if you can get money into like you know into the the borders and they should put more money into us playing with our cars and not worry about us we'll be a little bit calmer you know what i mean but yeah, true it's, um you know but but that's that's part of the problem why there's not a lot of endorsing of you know i read something not too long ago that gm is trying to get some kind of law enacted where the software that is in the controller is their private property. And if you go and tamper it, you're basically tampering with somebody else's property. I heard that, that too. concept. Oh, so they're making it like a digital rights management issue of what's in the car. Yeah. Ugh. I don't know where that's, where that's going, but that'll, I mean, that'll have the, the white house wrapped around with burnout marks around it. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, it, yeah. you, you know, it's the grain of our, our country. It's, the boy sport, you know, so I don't know where it's going to go. It's crazy that people will get involved in that. It is. Like politicians, the, uh, there's so much they can be doing and they're messing with cars. And the, and the funny thing is like the automotive industry, I mean, they recognize that people are looking for cars like this. Like they released the Hellcat with a, with a very high horsepower number. They, they sold through them. They couldn't quote unquote make enough of them. And I understand there's a whole deal. We've talked about that, that they need to keep their average of fuel economy in a, in a certain range across their entire offering. Yep. Um, but I mean, they, they see that these cars, that they, they don't have a problem selling them. It's what people want. And, you know, I, ju- I just think more cooperation if they could do it without the government getting too hard on them. I mean, and, and look, Tom and I, I talked about this and I'll ask you about it. It'll be kind of the next little subject from the computer side of things. When I brought, when my motor blew up and I swear I did nothing to it, no changes, no tuning, no anything. I mean, it was the first new Corvette, actually first new car I ever bought. And it, a thousand miles, I heard something. I called them. They said, the valve. no, no, it was a bottom end failure. Really? Yeah. I, and I knew Oil temperature was coming up very fast, like from startup, um, you know, faster than normal. I told him, I called him up, told him I lost oil pressure. I got the stupid speech from the service guy. Look, you got to understand you bought a performance car. It's going to act differently than you. Oh, Jesus Christ. And I said, look, it's making noise. And he's like, well, they're noisy motors, sir. They're a race motor. I'm like, oh, Christ. So drove it a few more days. Now it's going bad. And I said, look, you might want to come get this thing. It idles at eight pounds of oil pressure. Well, sir, that's within the spec, and when yeah. it's hot like this in the summer, and I was like, listen, either you're going to come get it, or I'm going to take it for a ride tonight, and it'll be here in a box. It, it, it's up to you. <laughs> and, you know, I went out to 78, ran it through first, second, top of third, nosed over, that was it, done, and it broke. But one of the things, they had the car for like a month and a half, because some special section of GM yeah, had to the come, forensic guys you had to come yeah. look at the car to make sure that sure. that the signatures matched that it was only a GM program in the car. And from what I heard, you can't put any kind of programming into the car and even put the stock one back without them knowing. Is that true? It is true. I mean, you know what started this whole mess was the guys with the <laughs> the Duramax diesels back in 2000, you know, 90 nine to 2005 because you can go out and buy a handheld programmer and blow 300 extra horse through your diesel which the motor was pretty much okay with but the allison was like i'm not dealing with this 
And when GM looks at the end of their year and says, man, we replaced a lot of Allison trannies this year. And they do a lot of testing. You've got to realize, I mean, it's, the, the durability testing that goes on in the OEM level is unbelievable. You know, millions of man hours that, you know, they'll, they'll take an engine, put it on an on a, a engine dyno that's rotating upside down and sideways just to emulate, you know, oil movement. And they know. And when they're looking, going, man, that's a lot of trannies we bought. Why? And then they start realizing what's going on. They're like, we got to stop this. And, you know, a guy would rip the Allison out of the truck, put his thing back to stock, and then they'd be like, you know. So they came up with a way to leave a signature mark that shows that even though you put it back and the data has been put back, somebody unlocked the door. Now, I got a question along that whole vein of things because I am a degenerate at heart. I can't help it. (laughs) If if I had a whole nother computer, is it possible to pull the entire computer out and bind the new computer with all the body modules? And then if it fails, bind it back to the modules supposed to have, or would they be able to tell that too? Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> he probably Maybe. doesn't want to say if he knows for sure. <laughs> uh, I was, yeah, I was good. Throw him under the bus. <laughs> Look, Personally, I was going to use the micro, the microwave trick. I was going to throw the computer in a microwave. So I don't know what happened. <laughs> And bring it back to him. Yeah. Boy. Yeah. I mean, you know, listen, I put put yourself in their shoes. I mean, we 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 have a program with a couple dealerships down here and we're we're able to actually put some level of warranty on the vehicle because I know that the parts that are gonna take the abuse can take whatever level we're at. Would I build a thousand horsepower vehicle and sell it to the dealer? Absolutely not. There's way too much potential. We know the risk. So, you know, GM says, hey, you know, we're proud of what we've done. We've tested the axle. We've tested this. We've built in all this logic into the controller so you can't, you know, torque management and all this other stuff. We'll back it up, and then we go and modify it and be like, hey, this broke. All right, well. I mean, and they got to buy it. I mean, you know, you got to have a little bit of understanding why why there's such a a lot on the line for these guys. You know what I mean? No, and and certainly GM's warranty side is is something they got to keep. And I, I don't blame them. And, I mean. You know, but to do dumb little stuff, you know, little things like you wanted your fans to come on a little sooner, you know, like, you know, inconsequential stuff. I understand tampered is tampered. I get it. And yeah, but the reason, but the reason why they, they, they don't even allow that is because it's either all or nothing. Just yeah. Leave it alone. And it's just like, you know what, we're not going to debate it. And there was a point when they would have to pull the calibration out. The dealership would actually send the calibration back to General Motors they would open it up and be like, oh, my God, a guy added five degrees of spark timing over here. He made the power enrichment. And they knew. Now they don't even give a crap. They don't give a <laughs> shit what you did. You, you touch the lock, you're done. Yeah, that bite's changed. Yeah, the, we in, in the electronics industry, that would be considered a fuse bite. If that bite is tripped, that's it. Yeah. Well, they figure they're giving you what you need from the door. That's why they're selling it at the price in the horsepower range. Yeah, well, it's never a car guy. It's never what you need. Yeah, that's <laughs> true. Well, you know what? I remember, do you remember there was an article when the ZL6 first came out and everybody was complaining about, oh, they're losing power at the track. They're laying over. And somebody from GM came out and made a statement that said, yeah, we've purposely designed the calibration so the, we can put a billion mile warranty on it. And this is what's going to happen. But if you want to go to your local tuner, go knock your socks off, you, they can resolve the problem, but you're on your own. So that was an interesting, like, yep, we know, and you're more than welcome to go at it, but don't keep us involved with it. Yeah, that's a bold statement. You know? that, that is a bold statement indeed. That's uh... <laughs> Hey, well, let's talk about some fun shit for a minute, Yeah, if we could. So um, Howard and I went to Dubai last March. Oh, it, it, because he did the the show. The what was it? A tuners challenge or, or his engine challenge overall? The engine challenge. It was what did they call that thing. Um, uh, well, it, it was the custom show. Yeah, well, it was a custom show, but it was the uh, engine battle. Engine battle? No, no, engine battle. <laughs> engine, right? Exactly, <laughs> battle. <laughs> but uh, yeah, um, I was actually lucky enough to choose the the American um, uh, engine battle participant. And I chose Howard, and uh, I'm going to be nice about it. But he went over and hammered them. That's that's it was that's pretty accurate. <laughs> well, I I was getting like kind of the play by play of the the things that went on with the vehicles, and it was oh it, well, that was a shit show. I'm sure that you know next time around it'll be a little better. I'd I'd actually like to go to the next one if you know things like that go. Yeah, just well, to I mean I'd like to see that area. It'd be neat. Howard's hair was on fire most of the time. Yeah, they Most. liked it. 
Most. I was like a freak over there. You know, they didn't, they didn't look like them. I didn't talk like them. And they, they looked at me like I was like some rare zoo animal, you know, <laughs> and, and we were caged in that area where the, where the trucks were and stuff. So it actually kind of fit the bill. So. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. That would, that would make me uncomfortable. Like all these people look and say, Oh, look, what is that? You know, that would, that'd be a little effed up. Yeah, you know what? They were, they were, I got to be honest. I mean, the, 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 I was excited to go. The concept of going there was like awesome, but there was a little bit of like, People are like, are you crazy? And then, you know, why? Because it's the Middle East, you know? And when we got there, there was nothing but consideration, cooperation. They were awesome, awesome, awesome people. They treated us great. A bunch of friends over there. Yeah, they, they, I, I, I can't even say enough. I mean, I'm anxious to go back and, you know, I made friends, you know, 9,000 miles away. I mean, guys, I still, we keep in touch and we talk and. Dude, you made one really good friend out there in the shed, right? I mean, he. <laughs> your buddy. <laughs> no, I think it was, wasn't it your buddy? <laughs> yeah, your tube steak, your tube steak. Oh, dude, we, this one guy, great guy, but you know, there's a language barrier and we were able to play with that. Uh, and he would drive us around and we would be talking and he just couldn't, he couldn't get the jokes that we were making. Right. And believe me when I tell you, it was really funny shit. Mm-hmm. Very, we had a good time. We had a really good time. Yeah. No, it was a great experience. And he won the whole thing. I mean, you know, it, it, it was a big deal. I mean, he, it, it was cool. I think we knew we were going to win because we're just, we brought the right guy. Yeah. Well, you know, I'll be, I'll be honest, I'll be honest with you. I mean, you know, you always have to, you can't, you know, you, you can't go into stuff with arrogance. You got to focus on it. You know, the, things could have gone wrong in any direction. I knew that we went over there with probably more GM experience in both engine building and most certainly on the calibrating side of it. So, I mean, I at least had some confidence going into it, but you know, those guys hustled, they got it done, they got the motor in, they got it running, and, you know, it's, you know, and then you don't know if they're going to play games with the dyno, and, you know, all this stuff's going through your head, and, you know, I think it was, uh, we flipped the coin and let those guys go first on the dyno, and after a couple pulls, I, actually, I, I can't even say that, I think the first pull that we made on the dyno probably just set it all right there. You know? Yeah, well, yeah, actually, the, the other guy, Foddy, kind of made a mistake in his first pull, and, uh, you know, Howard's been on dyno a little bit, and he knew he wasn't going to make that mistake, and. It was looking good for us. Yeah. So if I remember right, and you could correct me if I'm wrong, you had, you went to the dyno and that pole counted. Yes. Like, so you had to put a calibration in based on what was done. Yep. And, and like, so you had to start from jump without any kind of testing, tuning, calibration, anything, all from experience. Yes. That's how it had to work. Right. Exactly. I mean, you know, when you're working with, we, Basically, it was the average of 10 poles, five we did open, everybody saw, the other five on each side, nobody knew, they covered the screen, and, you know, they wanted to leave some suspense out of it, you know, and we flipped the coin and won, and I said, yeah, let him go first. Yep. So, and I, matter of fact, the numbers are still vividly in my head, I made, you think he made like 403, 408, 412, maybe 416, you know, the numbers are all relative, and I think we got in the dyno, and the first pull we made was like 425. Yep. Yeah. So, I mean, that, that just wiped out his five poles. I'm like, well, if we can keep at this pace and then he just, and, and not blow up. We, yeah. We, we actually went to dinner with Fadi. That's the guy. He's phenomenal. And we, after we had won it, we all went to dinner and I said, what happened? He goes, Oh my God. And he was just, he was, he was just finger banging that lap, laptop for just everything it had. And he told me what he had in the thing. And I'm surprised it didn't end up with fireworks. You know what I mean? Yep. So, <laughs> um, you know, and we, and we just, and I, I think I, I made the first program. We pulled it. I made one other change. Never touched the thing. The rest of the ten, the rest of the eight poles, and it just kept making more. True story. Let it go. Yeah. I think he made like four forty three. His best pull was like a sixteen, and and Howard's best pull was like a four forty three. Our best, our best pull, no, our best fifty two or fifty something. That's four, right, almost four fifty eight or something. Yeah, yeah. So it, uh, you know, but I some of it obviously was calibrating. Some of it might have been how we assembled the motor, knowing what we were doing. I mean, when you're when you're inching. You know, when you're when you're doing a competition and every every horsepower counts, it's different than you build a car for a guy and he goes out and street drives it. You know what I mean? That's right. Three, right. four horse left and right doesn't matter for us. It meant so. I mean, we had some some tricks and stuff up our sleeve with the engine and whatever. You know, but could have blown up in our face too. You know, but it, uh, we came out ahead. It was a big relief, and I think uh, it proved a, a bunch of guys over there that we're not a bunch of crooks and we like them and. I don't know if Tom explained how the how the win went, but you know we had the we we both built our own engines, and the winner would have got both of them. And you know I I kind of knew in my heart if we won this thing, I was going to let him have the motor back. You know what I mean? I didn't it, yeah. it didn't 
We didn't want it. We wanted the relationship more than I wanted another engine. I, got I think that I saw that on th- th- you know I mean? I think I saw that on TV. I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah well, he so gave, it sounds he, familiar. He gave it back. It was pretty cool. <laughs> they they appreciated it. Well, Howard. Yeah. This is Crunch. How are you? What's up, buddy? Whenever we have a a, a big time guest, because you're big time now, especially when you come with Tom, that. that's that's big dog stuff. So now I have to ask you a question here to see how honest you're going to be, and we want to take it back to your earlier years in high performance. Do you have any street racing and grudge racing for cash in your history? Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm, as, I'm glad you were honest. <laughs> hold on. As a matter of fact, when I looked at his page, right. I believe somewhere on Facebook or his page was a picture of the two steak oh, shacks. Nebus. Yep. Yeah, Mike's Mike Nebus, yeah, that started the whole thing. Yep. Oh, my God. It was. Oh, okay. I knew the answer to that when Crunch was going there because there's only one reason you're in those areas. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that, you know, it's funny. I, I was just back up in, in New York uh, a couple weeks ago for a family matter, and, and it was, I got there like midday, and actually it was the day before Labor, uh, Labor Day. So everybody was gone. I kind of came out and out. So I did a little memory lane drive around, and I drove. It, it's gone now, but it used to be a sub shop called Mike's Neva Subs, you know? And, you know, I remember when I got a driver's license, I think I had a 70 Nova back then, oh, okay. you know, building it in the garage. And I, I'll never forget that very first day coming off the arterial and the sub shop was like up off the arterials a ramp up to another road. So you really couldn't see the sub shop. till you got up to the intersection. And I remember pulling up there and I looked over and, and just the way the place was lit up with the neon cars everywhere. It was something straight out of like a fifties movie. You know what I mean? Yeah. And just, that was it. Wow. I was done. I spent the whole rest of my life Friday and Saturday nights hanging out from parking lot to parking lot. <laughs> like know, we all did. Driving like, yeah, you know, but it just, you just remember that place. And what's interesting was I put that picture on our Facebook page and I had a whole bunch of people be like, my dad used to hang out there. And <laughs> one kid even put up a picture of his dad's 69 gold colored Camaro parked right in front of the place, which was just like perfect mm. in comparison to the picture I put up. But you know, it's, it's where it starts, man. It's, you know, the, the, testosterone comes out of us pretty quick we we got to harness it somewhere you know so that's good stuff it really is yeah, yeah. no it was it was cool well thank you for being honest i, kn- I knew it was in you <laughs> yeah well i mean there's nothing i mean I, I don't know if it's about about being honest or not it's just about it's about the reality i mean i'm sure on some capacity we've all been loose on the street with something some of us more than others and yeah the money definitely made it fun and Right, right. You know, I'll tell you something. Down here in South Florida, there's a lot of, uh, I'll put it this way, culture yeah. yep. in that scene. And uh, I sometimes find myself wanting to get involved with it. And I just, unfortunately, as a business that's growing and stuff, I sometimes just got to, like, calm myself down and realize right. I just got to keep the stuff on the track. And I you know, I'll promote my <clears throat> customers and I'll help them get where they need to be. But it, you, know, you struggle with it because it's, it's genetically uh, wired. <laughs> You know? Yeah, we we've talked about a lot that as mm-hmm. as you get older, things change, things you grow change, up, and you just can't do the stuff you used to. You just he can't. Wants to, he wants to go out there and kick some ass for that money. Well, that's what his customers are for. <laughs> yeah. That's right. That's what yeah. his customers are well, for. Well, quick quick but question money, for the, you: the, the money the money just sweetened it up because you felt like it was that was you know you won, but like you you, you took something from the guy. It wasn't you know it's yeah. It was, back then, the money was important. Ten thousand dollars. Yeah, you know you're five six hundred dollars right. a lot back then. You know what I mean and. And it was, you know, but the win meant more than anything. You know what I mean? You come back into your, into the Mike's Nebas or the Caldors parking lot and you got yeah. 5,000 people around the car, they're ticking and smelling and, you know, you just push them to their paces and, you know, you're just, you're, you're trembling because you just, you've been hyping up for it for the whole week. You know what I mean? To gun right. somebody down. I mean, that's just, right. it works. Boy, that is a perfect picture of like after a race. That that's is it. verbally, that is absolutely, because anybody who's a real car guy, growing up, chances are pretty good. They went somewhere from parking lot to parking yep. lot. The cops told them to beat it and they yep. went yep. to the next parking lot. <laughs> everybody did it. Everybody. Yeah. We all did. Yep. Yeah. That one road that everybody went to race, so. Yep. Yeah, there was a there was a couple like that around here. And we don't condone street racing. No, no. We, I mean, you know, we did a lot of dumb shit. I'm sure you did too. I mean, just you know, stuff that you just wouldn't do anymore. Now we have a we have a friend down there too uh, that was on the show, uh, Tim from East uh, was Coast, Coast Chassis. Chassis. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So I don't know how far or how close he is to you. He's way up. Where's he at? He's in Daytona. He's he's at like four hours. Yeah, oh. it's three hours north. Three hours north. Oh, okay. Yeah. We're a little, we're for a little further south. Right. Okay. Hey, Howard. You know, I, I remember talking to you uh, pretty well a couple of weeks ago. You said you had some uh, new projects coming in. You got a, like a sixteen Camaro and a sixteen CTS V on order. 
Yeah, yeah. The uh, the Camaro is uh, supposedly due to be built the week of the 9th or something of October, and uh, the Cadillac got pushed back to January. Typical GM, you know, hey, come on in, buy it. Oh, we don't have that yet. You know what I mean? So, um, so that that's coming soon. But the the Camaro is going to be the Camaro is going to be fun because the current Gen Five Camaro, as any end of a model, you know, run is getting it's flat. You know what I mean? People yep. are bored, and, and uh, you know, and it's again, you know, I heard you guys talking earlier about the manufacturers and stuff. It's just like. You know, I love GM. I'll always be a loyalist, but man, talk about a day late and a dollar short design. And I don't know what goes on. I think the bean counters got to get back off and let the let the passion guys get back in the game because you know the new Camaro. I mean, when you look at it, I thought I passed it on the road the other day, and it was a 2015. Yeah, you know what I mean. Yep. I mean, it's like you're going to go through all this excitement and pull the wraps off, and it looks like last year's model. I'm like, come on, <laughs> really? You know. I know. I've been saying it about the Camaro. Yep. I've been talking about the Camaro for a while now, how ugly it is, I think. Yeah. So we're uh, we're up to some plotting and scheming already with that car. I mean, everything that we've learned from C7, obviously, it's a direct injection motor. And um, I got to give hats off the interior. The interior of the car is badass. I mean, the car is really nice inside, which GM knew they needed to do some tune-up on. But I just, I just think they're falling short again with the styling. I mean, the Mustang's awesome looking. Isn't it? You know what I mean? Oh, love it. I know, you know me too. Got to give credit where due, man. I mean, we're not, you know, we're car guys. We got to like everything, but Ford yeah. styling has always been great. You know, Dodge has done a good job and I don't know what's going on with GM, but I hear that. That's what it is. I kind of hate to admit the the look of the Mustang is pretty damn good. Bad. That 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 twists my stomach to even say that, mm-hmm. but it's And they bought yeah. the 5.0 back. Yeah. Well, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. not really. And the Challenger's always looked good and the Camaro <laughs> looks like ass. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Speaking speaking of these cars, I heard you guys, John, about the uh, um, the the renderings and stuff with the well, what they think is going to be the ZR1 or the C8. You guys yeah, are talking about do tell, man. You, what do you know? Um, well, I mean, what's funny again with GM is you know they they leak what they want and they think they're sending you over to the left and they're really just leaving you right where you were sitting. And um, I, I think what's going to end up happening is that you know if you look at very influential people like Zora Duntov whose name comes up quite often when they talk about this mid-engine, is that the mid-engine concept has been around General Motors for a long time, back to Zora's days, which are, you know, back in the you know late 50s and 60s. He, he just felt like they needed that. And, you know, all the loyalists came in and said, you can't do that. A vet needs to have the motor in the front, whatever. But I think with the new C7, most certainly the ZL6, with its, with its styling, with its punch that it has, and the price, when you really think about it, I mean, we have a supercar. It's the it's the ZL6, and if they're going to play in that supercar market and and try to horn themselves into Ferrari and Porsche and Lamborghini kind of world, they kind of have to go to that concept. Um, you know, there, there's definitely some pluses to it. I mean, it definitely gives them a traction benefit that the car needs for sure. Um, most certainly, cockpit wise and interior. If you've ever been in a new C7, there's like less room than there was in a C6. It's ridiculous, hmm. you know, and there's hmm. no place to go. And I think just that whole slant nose front exotic look is what's going to grab a whole other market that they need to get into. So um, I think it's coming. Um, there is no reason to make a, a, a ZR1 out of the current model because if you buy a Z07 Corvette, what more can you do? Well, you know, and that's you, breaks. You my, know, all this shit. my brother has a 2008 Z06. You know, I have the kind of in the middle. I think it was extra shit they had left <laughs> to make the 427. It's the only thing I can figure. Yep. Um, I, I have that one. And when the Z06 came out, we said, well, what the fuck are they? What could they possibly do for a ZR1? Right. I mean, you know, wh- where are you going to go from here? And the logical step would be to make a big change. And I mean, look, the big change was normally aspirated to a supercharged and, you know, I, I'd like to see the new platform. I mean, like everybody here knows that I was looking at a McLaren, um, for a long time. That's what I wanted to get. Cause I kind of wanted like the supercar kind of thing. And I, I chose the Corvette and when the new Z06 was coming out, I'm like, that's it. That's what I'm getting. And then I saw the weights came up and some of the other things. I mean, I know they're impressive, but just kind of not not what I want. I mean, I'd like the mid-engine design, me personally. Yeah. 
Howard, do you yeah, think I mean, you have to? You, you're going to get to a point with these cars. You know, everybody went from. You know, the C5 was was a tremendous jump. That really kind of the C5 is what really relit Corvette because it was done. They were ready to chop that car off the chopper block. It was going to be gone for forever. And interestingly enough, I mean, I don't remember the exact numbers, but you know, corporate came down to the Corvette team and said, "Listen, you want the car? We'll give you six million dollars to, to redesign the car." Which sounds like a lot of money, but Chrysler had three hundred million to design the minivan. And the the smart thing that GM did is they finally went out to their customers and they said. What do you guys want? You know, what do you, what do we need to do? And people are like, well, I want more legroom. I want my wife to be able to get in the car, not have her coochie hanging out when she gets in it. Or two sets of golf clubs have to fit. And I don't want the car to rattle with the roofs off. And I want more RPM. And I want, I want. And you know what they did? They gave it to everybody. And the car took off. And, you know, when the C6 came out with the exposed headlights, people were like, oh, no way. And then you did, then you loved it, you know. And then C7 came out, I hate it. And then the guy buys it. So it's. <laughs> you know, it's a it's a funny process of love hate. At some point, you you start succumbing to it. You know, and uh, you know, I mean, it's. I mean, I don't think we're going to see that mid engine for a, a little bit. I mean, I think that's that might be eighth generation car. I I hate to go on record with this, but I I really like the C five better. I I really do a lot and a lot and you know what? A lot of people we hear it a lot of time. I mean, especially the the fixed roof coupe. That's a timeless body. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's true. The ZL6, it just that is true. about that that look. I mean, it's I like to see it's got that roadster look. I like but, to see you know, if you but the thing is is you, if you're in this game and you enjoy it and you like the smell of the new leather and the glue, you're going to have to at some point you got to buy another new car. I mean, it's, you can't just sit there with your 97 Corvette and say, "Well, I, I'm digging my heels in." Okay. You know, you and your 350 horsepower can sit there while it's double, <laughs> you know what I mean? yeah, while the guy buys a 427 and blows it up in 1800 miles. Yeah, it's a real, real trade off. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, that's uh, listen. Then you got you got a bad experience. I know. There's, the Z6 hands down still not 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 counting the new one, which will get there maybe at some point. Although it's expensive, the 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 C6 Z06 hands down was the, was the best bang for the buck. It still is. In any market, in any territory, for what that car could do for the money it cost. Okay, question about the new Z or uh, Z06, the automatic car you mentioned before. Have you driven them? Oh yeah, we got a bunch in the shop. How are they? Badass. Well, in the Z06, or are you talking about the base car? Z06 eight speeds. Z06 specifically Z06 eight speed, which is called the eight L ninety E. Thus far, is proving to be a pretty serious transmission. Um, we're going to find out in the next couple of weeks when we put 900 wheels through one of them, how good it's going to be. But if you go back to the C6 era, you know, there was an, there was a six L 80, which was in the, which was in the base car. And then there was the six L 90, which was in like the Cadillac CTSV and the ZL one. And there was about a 240, 250 foot pounds of torque difference from GM of what the tranny could take. And golly knows we've put 1,000-plus horsepower through the, through the 90. Well, the tranny that's in the ZL6 is the 90 version of the 8-speed. So I've seen the numbers on it. They rated it in the low 700s, which means it's probably good for like 900 and change plus. Um, it shifts faster than uh, the Porsche tranny right now. And again, I have to give credit to General Motors because this was one of the first trannies that GM actually designed in-house versus subbing it out to like, you know, Gatrag or, or, you know, another tranny, you know. So that's amazing that it, it works, that it actually runs for them to do that. I have to give them hats off, and it seems to be living. I guess we're going to find out when we put some smack to it. For for me, I like, uh, I hate the fact that my car, I can go like 62 or whatever in first gear. It, it makes me crazy. I mean, the, to me, like the feeling that you're leaving – that much off the table, you know, I'm the first guy that says, well, you know, 411 with a, with a 0.5 something overdrive, I kind of, kind of could live with that. If I want to revert all the way back to my teenage years of driving something around at 2,500 or 3,000, yeah, yeah. but that new automatic, isn't that first gear like a 4.56 or something? It's exactly what it is. Yeah. yeah. Nasty. But they also got a 230, 240 something rear in it. So, I mean, they've got it. We, with the first one we had on the dyno, um, we always dyno a car in, in first, ge- in, 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 uh, whatever gear is one to one. You know what I mean? Right. And, uh, the automatic in the eight speed, sixth gear is one to one. 
So um, we dyno, we were baseline at one, and the dyno got pissed off because we were over 200 miles an hour on the dyno at the. At the <laughs> wow. So, so we, we dyno ball in fifth gear now just to keep the freaking wheel speed down. I mean, it was just. It was crazy. Now, what is the end overall overdrive of that one, of the automatic uh, and the Z06? I think, uh, well, I think... I thought it was point... Seven and eight. No, it's... Seven and eight or overdrive. I, I don't... It's going to be probably close to... I think it's in point seven to point point five, and inevitably an eighth. I mean, it's it drops up. So imagine point five overdrive with a 240-something rear gear in the car. Yeah. Uh, that's how I, they're passing the emission. That's how they're passing the mileage test. Yeah. Yeah, you're going 70 miles an hour, 800 RPMs. Boy, talk about something having to be smart in the trans and good at low RPM, yeah. we'll call it drivability. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, must have some good yeah, torque numbers, Yeah, you also got to realize, too, they got, you know, with variable valve timing, displacement on demand, this big gear resolution. I mean, that's how they're 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 making the government happy and, and getting around the mileage game. I mean, it's, and you know what? You, again, you have to give them some credit for 650 horsepower, Meeting and, and these emission standards are getting tougher every year, and they're they're getting the stamp and they're building the car. I mean that's pretty cool, you know. Right. That is cool. So, you know, when you really when you look at it from that angle, it's pretty cool. So, hats off to them. Yeah, you know, and then we take them apart and go crazy, and we don't we lose all the mileage and we go real fast. <laughs> <laughs> hats off to us. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's, that's what right. hacking's all about. Yep. Well, well, Howard, uh, plug your business. Uh, give us the num the name number. Uh, well, it's Redline Motorsports. Uh, we're, we're really not too too hard to find uh, through Google, and uh, we got a pretty robust uh, Facebook page. Instagram has been a lot of fun for us. I mean, uh, you know, it's uh, we're out there, you know, and we're not stopping, and we got no signs of slowing up. And I just, I guess, people just have to watch out. Man on a mission. So, um, I guess we're not too hard to find. No, you're definitely not too hard to find, and and we're going to keep you on our, on our radar and on our website and all that stuff, and uh, hopefully we'll we'll do something cool in the near future, and we'll get you back on here. Well, you know, one of my oh, friends. I, hey, I'm I'm sorry, go ahead, Howard. No, I was, I was going to say. I mean, I think this is cool that you guys are doing this. I remember Tom talking about this with me in Dubai, and I think we were in just a high of being out there. That I was processing it, not processing it, and you know, <laughs> when he called about the other day, I was like, yeah, this is. This is fun stuff. I mean, it's um, it's a great opportunity to you know network, um, different views, different ideas. I definitely you know I got you guys on Facebook now, and and uh, I'll be dropping some stuff on your on your Facebook page here and there, some cool stuff, and and definitely appreciate the opportunity. You know. Oh well, you're more than welcome. Yeah, this is this has been a lot of fun. You know, we're not professional broadcasters by any means. You know, we got you know all the stuff to do it. Well, and, Tad is. Well, Tad is. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> we're. But we're we're having a good time doing it, and you know the the fan base is growing surprisingly fast. Yeah. I, I think it tells you how many people are really into the car side of things. It's 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 interesting to say the least. But now how, we how far is the re- how how far is the reach? I mean, I, and I'm kind of I, you know Tom and I were talking quick the other day, and I'm trying to like I've I've learned more about the program in the last probably seven hours, and I've learned yeah, right. before. <laughs> now 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 I'm a fan, so I'm just kind of curious, like you know. How, how you guys continue to stimulate this and, and get more more people? Well, you know? I mean, honestly, what what helps is people like you, guests, no and doubt. Because when we have a guest on that has a big following, uh, a lot of people want to come in and listen. And we're doing something a little different than most podcasters are doing. Most of them capture, and Tom and I just talked about this today. They capture, they record, they edit, they post it. Um, we figured, look, we're idiots. We're, <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll we're, do it live. We're going to make mistakes. So <laughs> while we're running the session, why don't we put it live? We bought, you know, a, a real studio quality phone system. That's how you're calling in. And we could have 12 callers at once if we wanted. You know, I mean, you know, call on hold, you know, uh, you could have a call screener, the whole deal. So we figured if we presented it with with a live side as well. So people could actually interact with the show that that would help grow stuff. Now your side of things, we probably could have taken calls to see if people wanted to call in, if they had questions, but a lot of times that gets a little dicey. Yeah. And we wanted to talk to you, but listen, to answer your question about the reach, um, Mike and I were just talking about, we had, we got people from Italy. We got, we always have people from the middle East, um, all over this country. We're heavy in Oklahoma and Texas, and California, um, it's all, it's all over. It's, it's actually been pretty amazing. Right. And, and the only way you can't, you can take 
overall downloads. You can look and say, okay, you posted this show. The easiest way that that we can gauge how many quote unquote subscribers, like people that actually wait for the content to be published is that when you put an episode up, you get to see how many are downloaded essentially in the first like one hour. Cause those are people that are waiting for your content. So that's a good barometer. And when you see something like that occur and, and, you know, I'm really not going to hide numbers. I don't care. No. Our biggest one was the one with Tommy Martino and, and Dale Kubik from, from those guys, um, initial downloads in the first, uh, Christ, it, it was no a few, time. A few hours. And a few hours was surpassed anything we ever had. And I, I believe it was like in the first day window and it was only in the first few hours, it was 5,000 downloads. That's, oh, that's awesome. Yeah, that that's pretty good. So it, it's very good reach. And now you have to you have to tell Howard that we started off with two listeners in Utah. In Utah, yeah. and now we're up. Yeah, we're we're actually up in Utah. We're yeah. up in Idaho. Um, <laughs> you know what? We went a long time without having Utah. <laughs> yeah, like well, ten episodes. We were crying. Yeah, Utah didn't what like. What's going us? on with Utah? I think we're I think we're hitting Utah now. I like, got to tell you, the, I drove out there. I looked, and the worst one right now is North Dakota. North Dakota now? You need, you need to get you need to get Trump on here. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> oh Lord. I would love to get him on here, but I, I don't necessarily think he's a car guy. Maybe talk about helicopters. Who knows? Yeah, who knows? Yeah, I'll talk to him. Well, <laughs> look, Howard, it it's been great having you. And uh, I, I was gonna say before that, you know, I had been looking for a, a Malibu, like a G body chassis to to build a streetcar. Mm-hmm. And a bunch of my friends had said, and, and one of my good friends said, look, you got that other Corvette sitting in a garage. It hasn't moved. Um, that's a yeah, nice for, platform forever, to yeah. screw with. So maybe maybe that'll be the project car. I don't I know. That, I think that would be a good idea. And I'd like my always C5s. Got, always <laughs> got options. Yeah. <laughs> well, we'll be talking to you about that for sure. Sounds like a plan. Again, I really appreciate the opportunity and uh, – We'll have to do this again, and and uh, always open open line for uh, this kind of stuff and tech stuff and stuff. We're kind of, you know, I don't know if Tom's mentioned we do a lot of stuff with some of the the, the national magazines, and most of the stuff is all technical testing stuff, and we're pretty to the point with stuff, um, you know, and that that kind of adds some some good uh, uh, answers when people are looking to find out what works and what doesn't, because you know cars are are clinical. They, they either do it or they don't. You know what I mean? There's not uh, a lot of bullshit out there and how stuff works, but it really only works one way. Yeah. It, so. At some point, I'd love to have you back on to go more in depth, especially as a direct injection evolves, you know, when components yeah. become available and, and yeah, we'll do things get unlocked. Uh, I, I, I mean, I think it's a fantastic opportunity. Yep. It's just a matter of what can you do with it? And it's, it's timing. Yep. All right. Well, well, you know what? Keep, keep, Keep your eyes open in the next uh, two, three weeks here, and we're going to go out and try to go bust a, a big number with this uh, this Z06 here, trying to go for sub-950s with it. And most certainly when the new Camaro comes out, we have a recipe for that thing too, and that usually goes around the world pretty quick, and that's that's kind of how we're, we're trying to roll here, you know? Cool, cool. Point shoot. Perfect. So, okay. We'll be talking again, man. We got to talk about Dubai again too. I, you know, I was with the boys this weekend, so uh, I'll be calling yeah, my you. Bags are packed. I'm ready to roll. <laughs> All right. Well, <laughs> you can see Nishad, you can, plus you can see Nishad when we get out there. Man, I don't want to steal them from you. You know that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. I will call you. All right, guys. Take it easy. Thanks, Thanks again, again, Howard. Yep. All right, bro. Yep. Bye bye. Bye bye. Well, that was Howard Redline Motorsports. He was Howard, a good guy. Howard Tanner. I told Howard you. Tanner. I yeah. knew he would be. God, I had so many questions I wanted to ask, like the high pressure fuel system side and I everything, know. but I, I'm just, um, I know you could just keep on going and going and going. We could be here till midnight. Yeah. And Crunch is yawning over there. That wasn't me yawning. That I'm just me. sitting. Oh, that's it was Tad. Tad. That was me. But that's, uh, that, that was very informative. Yeah. The, We're getting great at this informative situation. Here. The, the modern electronic stuff is, is getting more and more advanced. And like, this was what we were talking about the other day. We didn't get his, uh, his, his spill on, uh. The pro stock, the oh, the, the carburetors, the, yeah, versus, all that yeah. stuff, and the, and well, the injectors. Yeah, I mean, we missed a lot. Yeah, uh, there yeah. was, we'll have him on again, dude. He was on almost an hour. I know, I know. Longest it just flew that by. Was a, that was an hour. Yeah, it was an hour. I knew it would go by fast. Would and you, you really didn't help us, Pat. <laughs> uh, Pat is uh, slang for Tad. Yeah, who was Ted. yawning in the in the mic, <laughs> coughing in the. Come mic. on, man, get in here. What? Where? When? <laughs> what? You know what killed me while we were talking, Tad? You're like, oh, yep. And you're like smiling, nodding your head. I'm like, okay, he's going to perk up and say <laughs> <Not> something. <up. laughs> nope. <laughs> That's right. Tad's going to kill it next week with uh, IEG and Subaru.
Yeah, that's uh, and we we started talk about that. What that, that's the Subaru? <laughs> yeah, the the this company when they come in, they're going to be on next Monday. Yep, next Monday. Okay, and you've already got that all set up, so we can. I do. All right, perfect, perfect. So, that that's good. That'll be a. And Tad's going to get the the guest for the week after. Who? Uh, yeah, I think he's going to the ex, ex lead singer of uh, Slayer or something. Yeah, there and, you go, Ty. And, you got to work before, on that. And before we go, uh, Fly Ty won his first grudge race for cash at uh, ACO. Nice. <laughs> Congratulations, Fly <laughs> Ty. Right. He, he was a good character. I know. He was really a good guy. <laughs> he was good. All good right. For, good for him. Well, we'll be back uh, Monday, and we're going to shoot for 7 o'clock again. So see you next time. Later. Later. Later.